Welcome to Global Connections on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today we'll talk about Modi and Zelensky, the implications of Modi's Ukraine visit. Our guest for this show is Rupmati Kandakar, geopolitical analyst. Welcome to the show, Rupmati. Aloha, Jay. Thank you for having me. Always my pleasure. Jay. A couple of weeks ago, uh, Narendra Modi uh, went to uh, went to Moscow and met with Putin. And now, last uh, few days ago, he he went to uh, Ukraine and and met with uh, Zelensky. Uh, what what is he doing? Why is he going to both warring factions in a in, in a region which is disintegrating? As you watch, what is what has he got in mind? Yeah, Jay, it's surprising that this was the visit that he chose, and uh, it's both Poland and Ukraine uh, two day visit. So uh, to Poland, foreign by a uh, train uh, journey to Ukraine. So it's a first visit by an Indian prime minister to uh, Ukraine after it started diplomatic relations since 1992. So that's the importance of this visit that nobody had visited Ukraine before him. And it comes uh, after his July visit. So it's right uh, on his back. And uh, Jay, he kind of becomes the only leader who's gone to both the places. And there were a lot of uh, eyes on him because of the fact that he was talking, uh, we discussed it, that India and Russia share a very strategic and very highly valued uh, partnership. So on that basis, this visit was uh, attracting a lot of attention and uh, we should discuss how it's going to unfold. Yeah, well, you know, one thing that comes to mind is, that, you know, I'm happy that he went there. I'm happy that he met with Zelensky. I'm, I'm happy that they were friendly together. Um, I was not happy that he went to Russia and met with uh, Putin and was friendly there. Hugs all around. But it, it does uh, somehow, maybe I'm being optimistic about this, it suggests that he has a, a certain amount of sympathy for Ukraine. Uh, that maybe, just maybe, uh, the um, historical relationship between India and Russia is uh, showing signs of wear. And that, uh, you know, I think that Modi is more than just a, a pragmatist. He may, he may care about Ukraine. Uh, he may care to do the right thing. He may, he may care for the moral side uh, of, of geopolitical relations. Um, do you think there's a possibility of that, or, or was this all for show? Jay, uh, I'll tell you that uh, a little background to this, that Modi, this is annually he's been meeting uh, Zelensky, and this is the fourth time that he's met. The first was in May 2021, then uh, 22, and, and then 23, and this is his fourth visit. So, And they have had seven telephonic conversations as per the Ministry of External Affairs of India. So Jay, he has had an interaction with him time and again, and uh, Modi's stand is uh, very well documented and uh, elaborated on every forum that he gets. He says that no problem can be solved in the battlefield, and diplomacy and peaceful negotiations is the only way out. Now, you know, Jay, if we take it back to Indian foreign policy, Indian foreign policy has always had a, a tendency to go for uh, non-alignment, uh, one of the blunders of uh, the Prime Minister Nehru, who always said that, you know, India should be non-aligned during the Cold War and all that. So he, he didn't have a very proactive um, um, role in uh, the contemporary politics. Modi has taken Indian politics to a different stage. And why that I say? Because his policy, he, as he said it, it is to be more closer to all the countries. So his policy is different now. Instead of being away from all, he's maintaining equidistance from all the countries and equal warmth with all the countries. Now, the hugs and embraces are now become a trademark of Modi. When he hugged Zelensky, uh, it was, uh, it was uh, on, uh, on, the, in, on the international media just because, you know, you felt that he was giving a sympathetic uh, hug to Zelensky. And the meeting place also of Zelensky was the uh, convention where he, he showcased uh, where 41 people had la lost their lives when Modi was visiting Russia and uh, uh, there was a crash in children's hospital. So that was the uh, place that these two met. 
and uh, Modi was visibly moved. So sympathy, definitely. And uh, you could see it on his face. He was moved. He was very empathetic towards uh, Zelensky's cause. Uh, but that, Jay, uh, we know, sympathy, empathy are very hard to find on the international stage. They go for hardcore politics, and it is always on the uh, table that, you know, it's hardliners that they are called. Hardline politics, that it's called, because they always negotiate between black and white. There is no gray area. And the sympathy, I feel, was in the gray zone. So that was just for a fleeting moment. So when they got to the... CJ, uh, Ukraine and India had a trade of around $3.39 billion before the Russia-Ukraine conflict. And after that, it has dipped down to less than a billion dollars. So uh, Zelensky came out and said he wants to increase this by seven, eight times. So he has got an ambitious plan with India. And uh, bilateral was involving, you know, so many um, uh, things like defense, industrial cooperation. You know, you have agriculture because Ukraine is the largest manufacturer of sunflower oil to India. So uh, matters of business followed this soft moment. You say that uh, either under non-alignment or Modi's new close to everyone alignment, um, he doesn't want to favor one country over the other, but the, the fact is that he's not supplying any weapons or ammunition uh, mm -hmm. or support uh, to Zelensky uh, to conduct Zelensky's defense of, of Ukraine. At the same time, he's uh, providing weapons to uh, Russia. He's buying oil uh, from Russia and thus uh, providing it with, um, you know, with money. And so um, that that favors. I mean, I, I don't know how else you could interpret that. That favors Russia. So uh, it's hard for me to understand exactly what what he's doing for Ukraine, aside from visiting and and being friendly. That is that is the right way to put it. Jay. There's nothing more to that because India supplied 22 tons of medical aid, like the Bishma uh, cubes. There are compact. Uh, uh, medical aid for the soldiers and all that. Uh, there is uh, agricultural this, but there is no uh, supply of uh, ammunition or, or military aid. Uh, Jay, I'll tell you uh, one thing backward that uh, the non-alignment hurt India a lot. It would have been much better if we had been this equidistance from all in the Cold War, because our uh, extra alignment with Russia gave us, you know, hatred from the U.S. So that was harmful for India in the long term. Everybody was favoring our adversary Pakistan over India. Till this policy has come of maintaining uh, good relations with all at one time. So that is a thing which has, with national interest in mind, that has come up. So uh, that is a very uh, plus point for his strategy. And secondly, Jay, uh, Zealand, we India has overtaken even China as the largest importer of crude oil from Russia. Now, uh, this question was asked to, I think, every uh, diplomat or every official in the Indian, Indian continent that why do you buy oil from uh, Russia? So the answer to that was that uh, Iran and Venezuela are under sanctions. Uh, you know, this is the India is a big consumer of oil and crude, and uh, as is Europe. And so as Europe, the, um, the um, explanation that is given is as Europe is taking in, we are also using it for energy needs. And that helps, that has actually helped India move through the recession, Jay. Otherwise, if India had to bear the costs of uh, um, high crude oil prices with a billion plus population, it would have made the economic collapse. And that is because India is mainly an agrarian uh, economy as of yet. So if you have that extra burden of uh, oil and gas, that, that would have really put extra pressure on the economy. Jay. So um, it is, but mandatory, no, it is, uh, what do you say? It is in the, under pressure that you have to compromise on these situations and put national interests ahead of your uh, sympathetic inclinations. Jay. You mentioned, though, that um, part of India's um, national interest is to stay friendly and to avoid uh, acrimony and hostility 
with the United States um, and, and with Western Europe. And, uh, you know, for the moment, that, that seems to be holding. I mean, there isn't really a lot of acrimony, even though when you shake it and bake it, uh, India is uh, buying a lot of gas and oil and providing weapons to uh, Putin, who is a rogue. Um, but here, I give you two, two possibilities, Rupmati. One possibility is that Ukraine somehow prevails in this conflict. And then the dust will settle somehow, and people will begin analyzing. You, as a geopolitical analyst, will begin analyzing uh, exactly how India has done, how it has come out of this. Uh, and if Putin uh, you know, loses or is thrown out of power, and there are those who feel he will be, um, then, you know, nobody's going to be too excited about what India did or didn't do um, during, during the conflict. And we can probably assume that its relations with the U.S. and Western Europe will be fine. But if Ukraine loses, if uh, this, this war of, um, you know, this, this long-term war uh, that Putin has set up, uh, if he somehow prevails over Ukraine and Ukraine, um, you know, is no more, uh, the world is going to look around and see what people did during that war and whether they supported Ukraine or didn't, whether they supported democracy, and India is a democracy, uh, or whether they, um, you know, turned their backs on Ukraine. And there will be blame. So if, if Ukraine disappears or is overrun by the Russians in some way, um, then people would be looking to assign blame. I suggest to you, Rupmati, if that happens, um, there's going to be some hard thinking about India's role here, that it supported Putin in buying the oil and gas, that it supported Putin in providing the, the weapons, and that it did not um, provide those things to Ukraine, and that therefore it was part of the scenario that led to Ukraine's you know, defeat. And in that case, uh, it will be on the wrong side of the blame game, don't you think? That is a rea reality of uh, um, politics, Jay, because it, India has to choose if India chooses to side Ukraine, it would strangle its own economy and go downhill. And uh, you see, India is the only country which is surviving. You have uh, Bangladesh, which is in a crisis, a political crisis. Pakistan, which is facing an economic crisis. Sri Lanka, which went into an economic crisis. So you have these collapsing economies around India. And if India had done this, got high oil prices, inflation rises, recession sets in, people don't have uh, uh, money uh, in their pockets, you know, there's uh, high spending. Imagine a billion people uh, doing this, the, the economy would not have sustained and definitely it would have collapsed. That is that is really basic economics that goes in that way. And uh, the second part of this, the twist to this is that Russia has never been an adversary of India. So India cannot go against Russia for Ukraine, uh, basically because of the strategic partnership. Now, keeping all this aside, Jay, you see that after Modi comes back from Ukraine, what does he do? Uh, some uh, a few hours back, he has said that there was a con tel telephonic, uh, there was a conversation with President Putin, and they discussed about strengthening the strategic partnership and. Uh, 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 what do you say? That there should be a peaceful resolution of the conflict. So this is the moral high ground that they have taken. There is a straight up thing that the partnership with Russia will keep on getting strengthened. So there is no dent in this right now. Now Zelensky showed um, naivety in his uh, international political stature when he, he spoke about, you know, he was taunting Modi like um, Russia did not respect you and doesn't respect you, and they bombed the children's hospital when you were on the visit. Uh, so that doesn't work in international politics. They are very hardcore politicians. They have their map set out, what they want to do, what they don't want to do. They're very hard. They're firm, Jay. They know what they want, uh, they, uh, they are set out to do, and they never waver. So if you say that 
you know, he was trying to poke Modi and uh, calling Putin a maniac or whatever. So, Jay, have you heard Biden and Putin calling each other maniac or something like that? They don't. You don't, in diplomatic words, you don't use such harsh language on the mic. Maybe you will do that uh, in the corner, but on the mic, you have to have a very, uh, what is diplomacy? The art of saying everything without saying anything. Uh, okay, well, let's uh, let's look at, um, you know, uh, this possibility of a peace. And uh, we'll get to timing in a minute. I do want to talk to you about the timing of the trip. But the possibility of brokering, negotiating, being a peacemaker in a peace between, um, you know, the two, between Russia and Ukraine. So number one is uh, query. With all that we have seen, um, does Modi have any real influence uh, on Vladimir Putin so that he could make that effectively make that suggestion? Why don't you guys have a peace negotiation? So far, Putin has not been sincere uh, in any effort to reach peace. Zero. Um, he's he's a very strategic guy, and that's not uh, you know in his list of tricks. So does does Modi really have the influence on Putin to cause Putin to enter into peace negotiations? Jay, they are more of diplomatic colleagues. Uh, for two decades, they have been almost working together. So that makes their uh, camaraderie a little bit more stronger than what he would have had with the personal charisma that comes across. It is less with Zelensky. Uh, this is not an issue that people are weighing in on the pros and cons. It is about how much you can milk out of it. How, many, how much cheap oil can I get from Russia? How much sunflower oil I can get from Ukraine? How much military aid can I get back from India? How much, uh, you know, uh, Zelensky said, if you stop buying crude oil, you'll bring him down to his knees. Uh, you think India will want to do that to put it... This is like telling him that, uh, giving him the power. It's not powerful. China will buy more oil. It will continue forever. It's not depend. Russia doesn't depend on India for, for uh, survival. So it's not a matter of just, and Europe will continue to buy. So even if India sets out, it's not that the Russian economy is going to collapse. China and Europe are sustaining it well and uh, uh, high above uh, high grounds. The suppliers of weapons to Zelensky are the exact buyers of uh, crude oil oil and gas from Russia. Uh, Germany is the second largest donor to uh, Ukraine. It still buys oil and gas from Russia. So, uh, Jay, uh, it's a uh, Jekyll and Hyde thing going on in uh, international politics right now. So everybody has got two faces. They will uh, keep Zelensky very occupied. And, and, and one more thing I would like to bring up, that the aid that Zelensky is getting, it's aid, it's not a loan that he has to pay back and he has to give back. 55 billion coming in from uh, America, you know, 11, 12 million coming from Germany. These things, these, this is not payable back. And that has led to huge corruption, Jay, in the ranks. Uh, when you see the line of defense that uh, the logistics that have to be provided to the soldiers, the first line of defense is the mines. Zelensky and his officials have not been investi in, uh, investing in this first line of defense. There is the soldiers are, are the first line of defense, and that is costing Ukrainian lives. So there are a lot of nitty gritties which have to be addressed before more aid comes in. And leave alone this aid, Jay, it has gone into billions and billions of dollars, uh, leading to corruption, leading to very high handedness amongst the uh, Ukrainian officials, the first thing that they want is aid. Uh, and secondly, they forget that after this, there will be post-conflict reconstruction. For that, you will need more aid, and that where will that come from? So these things are long-term goals. Right now, I told you, he's set into short-term goals. He's thinking of military aid. It has to be about post war reconstruction of Ukraine, what will happen? And Jay, um, uh, the peace settlements that he talks about that he wants to bring to the table, there has to be an end goal that you come to, a negotiating point that you come to. You don't want Russia to come into your territory. Sovereignty has to be respected. Russia doesn't want Ukraine to enter 
NATO. Bring this to the table and close it. But now, right now, it seems like it's more beneficial for the funding to continue and uh, let the war continue because this aggression into uh, uh, the Kirk's region and now the drone and now Russia's retaliation, it has gone into second gear. Instead of going down, it has gone into second gear. They're all, the aggression has started again. So in July, um, Narendra Modi went, went to uh, Moscow. And uh, at the time, it was just a war of attrition. It was a tit for tat. Uh, I guess it was mostly in the Donbass region. Um, and some and some attacks by uh, Ukraine uh, in the Crimea <clears throat> to um, military uh, facilities there, Russian military facilities. That's what it was. And it was, I wouldn't say it was contained, but it was, um, you know, it was not expanding particularly. Okay, now, um, right now, that is within the last couple of weeks, we have a huge expansion. We have the expansion of the Ukrainians into Kursk, and we should talk about why they did that and how that helps them and how that affects Russia and India, for that matter. Uh, and then um, uh, Putin's problems at home because mm -hmm. of the incursion into Kursk. Uh, and then, of course, his response by going into the Donbass and, and, and killing everybody he can kill and responding in the most brutal way he can. Um, and in blowing up all of their electrical generation systems in order to make Ukraine dark pretty much everywhere in Ukraine. So what I'm saying is it has expanded. It has intensified. Um, was this a good time for Narendra Modi to go to Ukraine? Um, if, he, if he knew this is all happening, in, both in Kursk and uh, in the Donbass, Shouldn't he have waited? Or was this a good time? Was, is, is this was something that would have encouraged him to go there now? Yeah, Jay, uh, the day that Modi uh, went, visited uh, Ukraine, the, the fire was stopped. There was a ceasefire for a day. Uh, and Jay, uh, Modi went on the invitation of uh, Zelensky. Zelensky was the one who chose this date to invite him. And uh, it was never on the cards till about... A couple of weeks back. So uh, uh, Zelensky chose the timing over uh, anybody else. Uh, and he expected Modi to be, uh, he tried to, um, what do you say, influence Modi? Because when he had sent his foreign minister to India, uh, Jay, he had requested for uh, a meeting with Modi, but Modi was meeting with Bill Gates. So the foreign minister uh, could not meet uh, Modi and he came just impromptu. It was more, more like a let me meet you kind of a thing, but that didn't go as planned. So this was like a uh, uh, visit from uh, invitation from Zelensky to Modi. And he said he, he would love to visit India and he plans on getting more aid and everything. And uh, Jay, um, what uh, Zelensky is uh, wanting to do or wants to do is get all the nations involved in this. What um, Russia does with China, their friendship, India doesn't interfere. The same thing is with Russia, Jay. It does not influence who India is friends with. So these two uh, nations are completely uh, oblivious and rather ignorant of what the other person's friends are. So uh, Modi going to Ukraine or talking to Zelensky was never going to have an effect on whether now he's discarding Putin or he's going to pressurize Putin. They, to they function totally independently. That raises the question of what, you know, what was achieved. Yes, they were friendly. Yes, it, it, it preserves the status quo as, uh, as far as India and Russia are concerned. It likewise seems to preserve the status quo such as it is between India and Ukraine, such as it is, um, what, what benefits and what detriments and what changes resulted from this meeting last week? See, in the face of war, Jay, the it is now the achievements might sound mediocre, but only around four agreements were signed in community community development projects, in agriculture, in drug, drug control, and cultural exchange. This was the field that was the agreements were signed. And defense, trade, 
uh, industrial development that came across as the future potential uh, talks that would be set up. So uh, humanitarian assistance to aid was discussed. Military, J, uh, India will never uh, supply because uh, J, um, that is about um, the stand that India has taken, right? Let me ask you, that you say never, and I always wonder about never. Um, there's been some uh, journalism and some opinion uh, that, that uh, Putin is losing power because of the incursion. Uh, and that uh, the oligarchs don't support him in the same way they did. Um, and that he may be subject to a coup. He may be subject to losing his power in one way or the other. Um, now, I don't know if that's going to happen. Nobody can know whether that's going to happen. But the possibility has been raised by some think tanks. Think tech. The possibility has been raised by some think tanks. And uh, let's assume for this discussion, Rupati, that in fact Putin loses power. Let's assume there's a change in leadership uh, in in Russia. Um, uh, could that result in a change of the relationship between Russia and India? Uh, I don't think so, Jay, because Russia and India uh, have been functioning through several leaders and several parties, op opposition parties also have been in power and continued the same kind of relation with uh, uh, Russia. Jay, uh, Putin remaining in power, not remaining in power is like a phase of time. It is but natural that the leaders who come into power will go out of power someday or the other. And right now he's in uh, top power. You, we know how he dealt with Wagner. But Jay, one point I would like to make that uh, the uh, way Zelensky came up with age shaming Putin that he wants to make in uh, Russia the best uh, that he can, but he does not have age by his side. So uh, that is never uh, kind, the kind of talk that would uh, come up on the diplomatic forums. And Jay, to reach that stature, you always require age. So uh, uh, age shaming him or age shaming uh, any person for that matter is a big no-no uh, in any way, Jay, because uh, experience that age brings in is different from what crash talk would bring in because he was very strong uh, in his vocal uh, talk and that does not get support Jay. you know uh, you have to be very soft on your words when you want to deal with such you can't face aggression with more aggression it leads to further aggression so he has to uh, when he attacked uh, uh, russia inside it becomes his bargaining power there was an exchange of 115 prisoners of war a first exchange that happened uh, two days back. It was the first exchange between Russia and Ukraine. So there can be a point where they can come together and talk. They can come together and negotiate. If 115 soldiers could be swapped, territories can be swapped. Wanting more aggression and wanting more, uh, um, what do you say, head-on collisions is not the step in the right direction. Well, you know, I, you may say that, but it's uh, it's existential. For Ukraine, mm -hmm. they could be gone in no time. And so I, I wouldn't criticize uh, Zelensky for what he said. I consider Putin a monster. Um, he's a rogue. Um, he is immoral. He is breaking all the rules. And although India, you know, understandably has a certain amount of sympathy for him, I don't. And I think a mm -hmm. lot of people don't here in this country. So the question, the question is though, um, how does this, um, this trip? And against the background of the incursion into Kurs and um, uh, Putin's uh, stepping up greater violence in Donbass, how does that affect the U.S.? How does that affect world opinion? Uh, mm. I suppose I could also ask, how does, how does it affect Modi in his heart of hearts? But, you know, things have changed. Uh, and I, I can't, and you know, uh, we we don't know how it affects Western Europe either. Um, it's in play. It, this is not a war of attrition anymore. It's a war in play, and it is becoming more violent, um, taking greater risks, more people dying, more cities being destroyed, more infrastructure being wasted. How is the world reacting, and how is Modi reacting? 
Yeah, Jay, see now the US elections is going to be a big call in November. If uh, Kamala Harris comes in, it's going to be good and aid is going to continue to Ukraine. If Trump comes in, you know, he's going to gift it to Putin. He's going to literally gift it. Uh, and uh, G uh, Germany and all, you know, these people are going to play both the sides equally because when they buy oil and gas and when they supply uh, uh, ammunition to uh, Ukraine, they nullify their inputs into Ukraine, Jay, because give and take from both sides. Modi, Jay, has become uh, a person who has voiced his opinion that the discussions, the negotiations are the only way to come out of this conflict and you have to have uh, diplomatic uh, resolutions, not military combat. So that's his stand, clear cut. He is not wavering for that, and there is no uh, involvement of uh, direct involvement of India in this Ukraine. Um, are they now that he's made trips to both Moscow and Kiev? Um, are they closer to negotiations? Are they perceptibly closer to negotiating a peace? Jay, he, uh, as soon as he returned from Ukraine, he called up Biden. He spoke about his Ukraine trip. He gave him insights. And the next person he called up is Putin, and he talked about strengthening the India-Russia partnership. So he's called his two friends, and he has spoken about what he wants to do, what he wants to continue. He's very clear in that. There are no, there's no hidden agenda in this. There is no uh, dilly-dallying. There is no false promise in this. And Jay, I can assure you that the military aid that we are giving to Ukraine, there is a limit to this, what can come inside. And it's like a bottomless pit that it is going into. So somewhere I feel Zelensky has to think about post-war reconstruction of Ukraine, because that is going to be more important than just pumping it into military. And now he wants long-range missiles, and he wants to... Uh, have territory to territory. Earlier it was just on the borders, and now it's going to go territory to territory. Jay, tell me if you see on the map, see the map of Russia, how much territory can we go into? So that would be a more difficult task for Ukraine to handle. So as a leader, when you know you cannot conquer, you have to have survival tactics. And that is what is lacking, I feel. His, his, his cause is not as desperate as what Israel is. Zelensky said that he thought the incursion would help bring this whole matter to a peace. I'm afraid I don't completely understand how that would work. Do you have any thoughts on that? Correct, Najee. If you poke somebody, they are going to retaliate. It's going to have a tit-for-tat, for rat tat, for rat -a -tat uh, effect. Uh, if you poke Russia and go into the territory, it's going to hurt the ego. It's better to defend your borders in such a situation rather than go inside. Now what? After you go into 300 square miles, you go 1,000 square miles, you go 2,000 square miles, then what? What do you do? How much army do you have to sustain this kind of a campaign to take over um, Russia? Guerrilla tactics worked in the Vietnam War. They defeated the superpower. Okay, fine. But this guerrilla tactics cannot... Uh, you cannot defeat Russia in this situation. He bombed entire Ukraine in a matter of uh, overnight, literally overnight. All the energy infrastructure was taken down overnight. And uh, where, where um, Ukraine was targeting the infrastructure, bridges and all that, it was one bridge, one uh, plant or one thing. But he has the capacity to go all out. Now when Zelensky asked for long-range missiles, if Putin fires a long-range missiles. Europe is a very congested place of 41 countries. They are all together. So if a missile goes here and there, it's going to have harmful effects for the entire region. It's going to be pulled into war. That may involve uh, tactical nuclear weapons as well. It may involve um, energy issues, energy infrastructure as well. So what I get, going back to my question to you, is... Uh, which was, uh, are we any closer to um, negotiations or the possibility of a peace with all that we have been discussing here today? And my answer to that would be no, we're not any closer. Uh, we may be further apart, but we're certainly, certainly not any closer. And that, and that, Rupati, means that you and I will have to follow this because <laughs> it is not a war of attrition anymore. It is something else.
And there will be events, there will be issues that arise over the next few weeks or months uh, that will demand our examination. So let's plan to cover it as we go forward, right? Yes, Jay. Of course, Jay. Looking forward to it so much. Thank you, Bhupati <laughs> Kandakar, our geopolitical analyst. Thank you so much. Aloha. Aloha, Jay.